Okay, so let's uh, restart the class. So, what what is the uh, country risk premium for India? Can anybody tell me? Country risk premium for India. Four point five. So how did you calculate that? That we had thirty two divided by. 21.3, what's the answer? Oh. 1.5. Around 1.5. So we can see that in India the stocks are about that much times more variable than the bonds. So then we multiply this by 3, we get 4.5, right? And then we can either add this, I put here 3.88 from 2009, or 2012 it was 4.2, right? Then we find our risk premium for India. Okay. So this is. Do you have any questions about this? Okay. Will you be able to answer this question if it's on the test? No. Why not? You just told me now. What's difficult? What's the difficult part? Um, phrases to yes, the vocabulary is difficult. So one student asked me what does default spread mean at the break time, right? Default spread is uh, one country. We have two countries. The US is rated A, for example. India is rated B. So which country is more likely to default? Do you understand default? India is more likely to default. Default means not to pay back all of the money. Okay, so India is more likely to default. How much more? Can we put a number on this? How much more likely is India to default than the US? If you look up here. What percent? 50% more likely? Do you think the Indian government will default? No? So what percent more likely than the US? 3%, right? We can see here. Default spread based on rating, 3%. So this is the this default spread. Default spread is how much is the difference of the chance of defaulting? Okay? How much is the difference of the chance of defaulting between our country and a very safe country like the US or Germany, okay? AA rated country. So the default spread for B is three, for C it's going to be higher, okay? So we know our default spread, but this is for bonds. This is for bonds, okay? So we need to change this to a number for stocks. How do we do that? We find out the standard deviation of the stock market, standard deviation of the bond market, which is higher? Which has a high, which goes up and down more, bonds or stocks? Stocks. Stocks. Which has a higher standard deviation, stock market or bond market? Stocks. Stock market. Stock market. Okay. How much higher? One point five is about fifty percent higher, right? That's that would be one hundred and fifty percent compared to one hundred percent. Okay. So we add on fifty percent stocks. Move up and down 50% more than bonds. This number is for bonds. So we want to change this number to make more applicable for the stock market. Okay? So with this risk premium, we're talking about the stock market. Okay? Here. So <coughs> we calculate this number. How much more risky are stocks than bonds in India? What is the default spread for Indian bonds? Multiply them together, and we get a number. It's called country risk. Country risk premium. Okay, talking about the stock market. So we'll we'll look at later. We have a here is country risk premiums for countries. Right? We can make a chart according to the country's uh, rating and. Uh, we, we can see that the country risk premium for the US is zero, okay? 
Here we're using 5.8 as the risk premium. Canada, US, North America, zero. What other countries are zero? Norway, Finland. They have zero country risk premium. Their country is not more risky than the US, okay? Which country has a high country risk premium? What do you think? Have a guess in the world. What country has a high country risk premium? Stock market is going to be more risky than the US stock market. What kind of country? Tell me a country, any country, you think might be risky to invest your money. Greece. Greece, Greece and Europe. 10.5% premium. Total, 16.3%, okay? It's quite high, okay? So this is country risk premium for Greece. So we can calculate the country risk premium ourselves, or we can try and find somebody else who already did that, and try and find a chart, okay? So we should know where it comes from. So we're investing in Greece, we have the European risk-free rate, okay? Plus country risk premium for Greece, okay? Then for our individual stock, we'll have our beta, which we'll talk about later. So we talked about the historical way to calculate the uh, risk premium, but there's another way which is also often used, which is more forward-looking. This is, we studied in the time value of money, present value. Do you remember present value? So that's why we studied the time value of money first, because we wanted to understand about right, these kind of things. It makes it easier to study now. So we had net present value. So we had in time, va in time value of money. In the future, I get $100, okay? How, what is that worth today? What do I need to know? So in five years, I get $100. What do I need to know to figure out what it's worth today? Interest rate. The interest rate, okay? So I make my equation, and I can say what this worth today, okay? $80 or $70, depending on the interest rate. So what we are going to do in this case is we are going to look at what is going to be the future value of the stock market? And what's the, change that to a net present value, okay? Then find out what, find the interest rate. Find the interest rate. Do you remember that we had one question to find the interest rate? It was question number four on the exercises. Was uh, we have 300, bond 300 today, it's worth 1,000 after 10 years, okay? Today it's worth 300. What's the interest rate? Can you what was the interest rate? Can you remember? It was about 12.8 percent. Can you remember how you calculated the interest rate? You took the equation and you solved for R, right? The present value equation. You have your present value. You have your future value. Find the R. Okay? The answer was 12.8 percent. So that's what we're doing here. We're saying. This is going to be the future value of the stock market, okay? This is the present value of the stock market. So what is R? Then R is our premium, okay? So for the interest rate, we are going to use the risk-free, okay? Or sorry, uh, we'll use the risk-free as a growth rate later. So let's have a look at an example. It's a bit clearer. So. First of all, we find our average yield between 2001 and 2007 of dividends because we want to get an idea of what the dividends are going to be. When we look at the future value of our investment, for bonds we, have, we, have, uh, we could have a coupon. In this case, we didn't have a coupon, but we could have a coupon. Okay? But for stocks, we have dividends. Dividends and stock price increase. There's something else we can think about in stocks as well, and that's called buybacks. A company buys back the stock, okay? It means that you're going to get paid more, a higher share of the profits. So less people own stocks, you can have, uh, the company buys back stocks, it's taking away stocks, right? Rather than issuing stocks. 
So it means that you can share in a higher portion of the profits. So we, we add up the dividends and the buybacks for each year. And we find out that the average dividends and buybacks between 2001 and 2007 was 4.2%. So we are going to say that we are going to have, uh, if the average of dividends is 4.2%, we're going to use this for the future to make a prediction. So January the 1st, 2008, the S&P 500 is 1,468, okay? 4% of this is 59, so we expect to get the dividends of 59 here, okay? Then the next year, uh, we expect that the uh, dividends is going to be growing. Why? Because analysts, analysts expect earnings to grow 5% a year. Experts expect companies to make 5% more profit every year. So therefore, the dividends will grow 5% a year. So this year it's 59, right? So we go on, it goes on growing at 5% a year for the next number of years. After year five, we assume that earnings will grow at 4%, the rate we calculated here. Okay, so we listen to the analysts for these five years, and then we use this number to estimate after five years. So <laughs> then we make a calculation. Okay. So if we know what the investors paid for stocks at the beginning of 2007, and we can estimate our cash flow from the equity, the cash we're getting every year, we can solve this for OR. So we have this is our present value. Okay, this is our cash flow every year for five years. Okay, each year we have the equation. Here we had, in order to find this, we had 300 equals 1000, right? Over 1 plus R to the power of 10. Okay, but in this case we do it for every year it's different, so we do every year. Year 1, 1 plus R. Year 2, 1 plus R squared. So we find all of these values. We solve for R. We're going to need a computer program to do that calculation. Okay? It's not an easy calculation. We could do this calculation. We put this over here. But we have to find out what's the number for R here. It's not easy. We can use a computer program. So you don't need to be able to do this calculation. Okay? I just want you to know where it comes from. We're finding R, just like we did in this case. We know the present value. We know our cash flows. We know future values. Find R find the interest rate, okay? So we find out that our expected return on stocks is 8.3% when we do that equation. So then we have to take away our uh, T-bond rate and we get 4.3% uh, because this is a premium that we're doing in the equation. So. Uh, this is uh, applied implied premium. So implied premium is looking, what we need to know basically about the implied premium, we don't need to be able to do the calculation. The main point we need to know about the implied premium is we are looking at the future cash flow. What are the future dividends going to be? Okay? And we're discounting that back, right? We know our present value, so we, we calculate the OR in that way, in that equation. And this gives us what we call implied premium. So here we can see the average implied premium from 1960 to 2007. We can see that it, it can change. Okay, so here's the percentage on this side. <coughs> so we use this uh, date range to calculate it. But here we have uh, the different dates and we can see that the implied premium can change it changes more than the historical premium <coughs> so in May 2009 the number for the risk, equity risk premium for the mature markets was 6% so 
So the implied premium at the start of the year was 6.4%, but it changed, okay? Because the present value is always changing, right, of the stock market. Present value is changing. So it's going to be a different, different number. But it's still much higher than the historical risk premium. The historical risk premium calculated in 2009 was 3.88%. So different numbers. Okay, so at this time in 2009, the crisis was abating, means the crisis was getting less. Okay, so we can understand why this number is higher than this number, right? This is a historical premium over 100 years. But this is just after the crisis in 2009, okay? So the stock market, the present value of the stock market was very low compared to today, right? Or historically. Even though the earnings in the future, the dividends, earnings was more or less the same, right? So or is going to be a higher number because the present value got lower. If the present value got lower here, it went down to 100, is this going to go up? This number is going to go up? Yes, right? So similar here, 2009, after the crisis, the stock market present value was very low, so the ore was going up, okay? So the investors were more risk averse at that time too. So even though the companies offered, still offered a high profit, people didn't want to buy their stock, they were risk averse, okay? So we have to decide which one is more accurate. Which one are we going to use? Are we going to use the implied premium? Or are we going to use the historical premium? <clears throat> so, uh, again, for emerging markets, we do the same thing as the historical premium. We, have, we already calculated the country risk premium for Brazil, 3.95%. Add this to 6%, 9.95%. Okay, so just, same with the historical premium. For the emerging markets, we add on a, a, what we call a country risk, country risk premium. Okay? So, uh, we can say that the, in 2013, the S&P had gone up since 2009. So, we need to update the implied premium. Okay? We also had some problems in 2013, political problems in the Middle East, debt problems in Europe. Okay. Uh, the Treasury bond went down to 2%. So we, the implied premium can change according, more so according to what's happening in the economy. Okay, so uh, if we do this calculation in 2013, we have this as the present value. We have the uh, future cash flows, and we find OR. And in this case, we found out that OR was 5.78%, slightly lower. So, we can see that the, now the growth rate, the analysts expect the growth rate to be 7.7%. In 2009, they said just 5%. So, the, things can change, okay? And this uh, implied risk premium, more than the historical one. So, uh, here's a graph showing the implied premium in the US. We can see how it can change here. In 2001, it was just at 2%, the implied premium. Okay, then just before 2000, in 2001, we had the IT crisis. The implied premium went up a lot, right? Risk, risk off. Is that risk on or risk off? Are investors re risk on or do investors want risk or don't want risk after the IT bubble? Don't want risk, so the implied premium went up, right? It's gone up to 4% quite quickly, okay? Then the, uh, we had a period here and then we have the financial crisis and then it came down again and up again, okay? So this is the implied premium. So, this is just again how a guide about how to get the equity risk premium for countries. So first of all, estimate the equity risk premium for a mature market like the US or Germany. Okay, if you 
you have to decide, do I want to use the historical one or the implied one? Okay? So, if we use the implied premium, it's going to be 5.8%. Okay? What does this guy prefer? He says it's good to know both of them. It's good to know the historical premium and the implied premium. Sometimes we can mix them a little bit. We could say that in between, somewhere in between the implied and the historical premium, right? But we can choose one or the other. In this case, let's choose the implied premium, 5.8%. Okay? Then we need to make a measurable definition of a mature market. So the US is an AAA rated country. Okay, we said over here, we're looking at the default spread. The AA rated country is no risk. Then, <coughs> estimate the additional risk premium we are going to charge for markets that are not mature. So we have two choices. The default spread, we talked about the default spread. Just simply use the default spread, or the better one, which is a scaled up default spread. More accurate. We adjust the default spread upwards for the additional risk in equity, not in bonds. So here we saw before this graph of the country risk premiums. We add on. So <coughs> let me ask you a question. If I am the CEO of Coca Cola, what country risk premium am I going to use? US. Yeah. Only the US? I'm a, I'm a US company, so I just use the country risk premium of the US? No. No? What should I do then? Analyze in what countries you sell more. Yes, right? Where am I doing my business? Where am I investing? Where am I selling my goods? Let me give you an example of a US company which does 10% of its business in the US, a real estate company, construction company, and does 90% of its business in Egypt, construction in Egypt. Which is affecting the profits of this company more, the economy in Egypt or the economy in the US? The economy in Egypt, of course, right? So if we are saying how risky is it to invest in this com company, should we be looking at the country risk premium for Egypt or the US? So which is more important, where the company is registered or where the company does its business and gets its revenues? Where it does business. Where it does business and gets its revenues, right? That is more important. So that's what we are going to look at. Okay, so how can we know where the company gets its revenues, right? So the conventional wisdom, the first answer people gave me was, let's use the country where it's incorporated, where it's registered. Okay? But actually, the more sensible practice is to estimate the ERP, equity risk premium, based on where the company operates. So Coca-Cola, where do you think Coca-Cola gets its revenue? If I was to tell you, Americas, Asia, Europe, what percent would you tell me? America, what percent? About 1%. 20. Uh, Europe, what percent? 30. Asia, what percent? Fifty. You think Asian people drink more Coca-Cola than the U.S. people? Chinese. If there are more Asian people, right? So let's have a look and see if you're right. So North America, forty percent. Okay. Western Europe, twenty percent. Eastern Europe.